We aim to showcase our school's future-oriented vision for learning. In each episode, we're going to link up in thought partnership with our own students, our teachers, leading schools, movements, and educational leaders from around the world that inspire, invigorate, and inform our international school practice. Hey there, BFIS listeners. Surprise twist. You won't be hearing from Rachel in the opening of today's podcast. Today, I'm stepping in. My name's Lila Jorge, and I'm the Associate Head of School and Designated Safeguarding Lead at BFIS. In this episode, titled Building Healthy, Safe, and Inclusive School Culture, we're delving into some serious territory. Rachel Huffington, our Head of School, and Dan Furness are about to unravel the complexities of safeguarding in international education. Get ready for a deep dive into the evolving landscape of child protection, with insights that might just challenge your perspective. So grab your headphones and get ready to join us on this thought-provoking journey. Let's begin. We welcome Dan Furness, who is the Head of Safeguarding and Wellbeing for the Council of International Schools. Dan's been a first-class counselor, school leader, and safeguarding lead in international schools located in the UK, Germany, the Netherlands, and Korea. He's now making an impact as a global leader in child safeguarding well-being. Dan has a master's degree from the University of Bath in the UK, a forerunner of research in international education. And he's worked and been mentored by some of the leading thinkers in child protection, most notably recently consulting on Tim Garish's team, the International Child Protection Advisors, ICPA. Tim was formerly head of the UK National Criminal Intelligence Service Serious Sex Offender Unit. Before working with the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Center, SIA, for IPCA, Dan's role was working with international schools and child protection practitioners to consult in school policy and practice to enhance on-site school safeguarding practices, essentially making sure that kids are healthy, safe, and feel included and belong in school. Dan, dive into the pivotal role schools play in engaging parents, navigating cultural nuances, and preparing students for life's transitions. They underscore the importance of a comprehensive well-being curriculum, covering vital topics like sexual education, online safety, and resilience building, a journey that mirrors our current efforts at BFIS. As they engage in this discussion, I'm here to offer insight into the parallel work underway at BFIS. We're committed to fostering a learning environment that prioritizes the health, safety, and sense of belonging for all of our students. I'm Rachel Hovington, and welcome to the Future Is Now podcast, where today we are welcoming Dan Furness. Good morning, Dan. Welcome to our Future Is Now podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about building healthy, safe, inclusive cultures. Um, you're a first class counselor, school leader and safeguarding lead. I've had the pleasure of working with you closely um, in Germany. Uh, you can tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah. So um, since I've worked with you in, in Hanover, I moved to Erd International Boarding School and I was boarding uh, and, and uh, pastoral care there. Um, and part of that role was being designated safeguarding lead, which is, as you know, something that I've done in a number of international schools now this last summer. I made the move to, to CIS in this role. And so during this, this time, I've been working as an independent consultant with uh, Tim Gerrish from ICPA, which is International Child Protection Advisors. Um, I've now finished that role because I'm now working with, with CIS. And so kind of uh, running the workshops here, but also uh, leading advisory work with uh, schools if they have a concern about safeguarding, they can contact me. An exciting project that we've just launched is in, in my role here is the, the International Safeguarding Toolkit, which we've just launched uh, worldwide. And that's a toolkit that schools can access to support their journey in safeguarding, which is a super exciting thing to be a part of, actually. Fabulous. And I'm looking forward to diving into that. I received that the other day. So um, I passed that on to some colleagues. So we're going to going to meet around that so we can leverage all of the resources that are in the, in the toolkit to help us on our journey here at BFIS uh, around safeguarding. You've been in this game for a while, Dan. How has the international school landscape around safeguarding changed? Um, how has it shifted, adapted in recent years? I think this started with, uh, what was it, 2015? I think it was around that time. 
with the William Vahey case. And I think that kind of caused the sea change in, in international school education and this kind of urgency about we need to do something about safeguarding here. We need to make our schools safer. And so, you know, what came out of that was the formation of the task force and the International Child Protection Task Force. And I think that kind of set out the umbrella for the expectations of our industry in international education. And, you know, coming from that, the initial focus was on obviously sexual harm from predators within schools and international schools. But then from that, we've seen, uh, you know, COVID, you know, a pandemic hit. We've seen mental health needs of students and staff rocket. We've seen uh, the need because of that, uh, because of those two things of a trauma-informed approach to working with young folk. And I think that's a really important aspect of of where safeguarding is going. And, and in kind of in, in context with that, looking at a contextual approach to safeguarding environment in which that incident is happening, especially so in international schools, right? Because we are microcosms of that. We have our own micro organizations and cultures. And it's so important to understand the context of that when we're dealing with safeguarding. We're sometimes you know removed from the, the UK or the US centric areas and, and, and approaches so you know we, we we have to be aware of those contexts and i think you know on the on the back of that at cas what we're really cognizant of is uh, the importance of decolonializing safeguarding yeah you know, and leading this intercultural safeguarding approach looking at how we can go beyond the anglo-saxon view of america and the in the uk and understanding what international safeguarding means and i think that's an area we're going to be looking at you know idea we call it idea i think other people call it different things for us it's uh you know, inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism, and the importance of of embracing anti-discrimination, anti-racism, inclusion in our safeguarding work is is just huge because we know that young folk are are vulnerable and those from minority are even more vulnerable. And so we've got to build that into our, our safeguarding approach there as well. Rachel and I are eager to delve into the recently received um, International Safeguarding Toolkit. And our enthusiasm to share it with our colleagues at BFIS reflects our collective commitment to leveraging resources to provide a safe haven for our children. As Dan pointed out, the landscape of international education has undergone a significant shift in recent years, catalyzed by events like the William Vahey case and compounded by COVID-19. In response to these challenges, we at BFIS have taken proactive steps to adopt a trauma-informed approach to safeguarding, recognizing the importance of understanding the unique cultural context in which incidents may occur. Our most recent revision of our belonging, inclusion, and safety policy underscores our dedication to protecting and providing safe spaces for all of our students, especially for those that are most vulnerable. The policy also establishes a framework for preventative practices and procedures to guide our intervention and response when instances of peer-on-peer -peer harm may arise. Moreover, Dan's emphasis on intercultural understanding resonates deeply with our approach. We acknowledge that safeguarding initiatives must be inclusive and culturally sensitive, extending beyond U US and UK-centric perspectives to honor local culture and laws. There is a common belief that the U.S. and U.K. are the ones at the forefront of this work. However, here in Spain, recent legislation such as a gender equity law passed in 2007 and the equity law for LGTBI, as it's named here, and trans rights, passed in March 2023, have set progressive standards for protecting vulnerable groups. These laws outline clear practices for nurturing and fostering inclusive communities, emphasizing that all individuals, regardless of their own identity journey, deserve equal rights and respect. Anti-discrimination measures are clearly established within the law and require that our curriculum reflect resources and materials that incorporate discussions about inclusive language and representation. At BFIS, we are committed to incorporating these principles into our curriculum and school policies by promoting acceptance, understanding, and empathy among our students. We strive to create an environment where everyone feels valued and respected. Through inclusive teaching materials and discussion on diverse family structures and identity, we can aim to dismantle the social cultural constructs and foster a, a culture of inclusivity and equality and equity. Ultimately, 
Our goal is to ensure that every member of our school community feels empowered to express themselves authentically, feel free from discrimination and prejudice. By embracing diversity and honoring local cultures, we can also create a safer, more inclusive learning environment for all. I think uh, understanding that the William Vahey case was uh, a situation where somebody who'd worked in international education for many years had had moved from school to school uh, with no background checks that brought up any uh, nefarious behavior, any uh, worries about their their work with young people, um, was exposed as someone who for decades had, had taken advantage of young people. And at that point, the international school community, the network, work came together. The Council of International Schools led that. Um, the Educational Collaborative for International Schools, ECAS, was involved. Uh, all the major international school recruitment uh, companies came together. Uh, AISH, the Academy of International School Heads, came together, and they really prioritized what was important in international schools and, and what we should be thinking about in terms of a checklist uh, in, in initial stages. CIS has been the forerunner, I think, uh, the gold standard standard of uh, workshops uh, for staff and uh, for school leaders to have them understand everything from the modus operandi of someone that would take advantage of young people to the kinds of things that you need to do day to day in a school to safeguard uh, young people. So which areas do you think are still priorities or hard to reach areas uh, and how can schools ensure they're adequately prepared for them? A lot of the areas that we see are as 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 key areas that we that, that are either hard to reach or priorities are things that we focus on our, our deep dive workshops on. And, and that's precisely for that reason, because you need that deeper level of knowledge to be able to get to them. For example, peer on peer abuse is a is a really good example of that understanding that the majority of abuse that young people will experience can come from their peers. And, and when we're talking about peer, I don't necessarily just mean a student in the same year group. I'm also talking, of course, about, you know, that, that cross age group approach where you might have students in your secondary school um, interacting with students in the primary school. So that's certainly an area that is that is hard to reach as well, because obviously for young folk, they, they don't always involve us in their worlds. Right. And so that can be hidden. Speaking of hidden abuse, we also talk about online harm. And that's another area that is incredibly uh, difficult to to access um, and changes so much, right? And I think this is the the bit that a lot of folks in schools feel so nervous about is that is knowing what's going on online can change month to month. And so staying up to date with that is really important. And we've developed a, our first deep dive workshop into this area because of that. Uh, so we'll be working with ChildNet on that to deliver a deep dive into kind of the preventative aspect, how we educate folks on that, you know, how we engage parents, but also um, how we deal with those situations in case study approach and you know, how we deal with those high level concerns around uh, online harm. And then another area that is, you know, that I think sadly we've both got quite a lot of experience with is self-harm and suicidal ideation. And that's an area that, you know, on the back of what I mentioned earlier around the, the rising concerns around mental health in young young people, we're seeing rising uh, incidents of self-harm and, and uh, suicidal ideation. And I think in self-harm, it's, it's quite interesting. We, we've got a, a deep dive coming up on this in person in Leiden and one of the speakers is we in, in our preparation has made us aware that you know the diagnostic manual uh, only introduced self harm as a condition in 2018, right? Um, and it's incredibly difficult to be diagnosed with with that. The, the threshold is so high, and yet we see the incident rates of that you know so common these days, right? And I think when when parents first find out that's happening. It's a huge shock from a professional's perspective. We see it more and more and more, you know, as a way that students are, are a coping mechanism they're using to, to deal with some really tough mental health uh, concerns that they're experiencing. And then off the back of that, of course, um, suicidal ideation and and the, the whether we're talking about um, students who die by suicide or just the, the ideation aspect of, of thinking about that and all the concerns that brings with it. There is little understanding into the motivations and the treatment of that at the moment. And then the rising trends along the side of that is self-harm and suicidal ideation is a real concern. So we have a, a rising trend and, and we don't have the knowledge about it that we want at the moment. So 
And that's a, that's a key area that I think is incredibly hard to reach. I think, um, Rachel, can you remind me about the statistic with um, students who, who die by suicide who don't say anything to anyone about it? I think it's something between 70 and 90 percent, isn't it? It's absolutely uh, something which is incredibly frightening because, uh, as you say, so it's something on the very high scale. I think you know, twenty five percent of our students might tell us beforehand, but if they've made a decision to go there, seventy five percent of them are not going to say anything. So the the opportunity to intervene at that point. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It doesn't matter what conversations you're having with them as parents or as as uh, as educators. It, it's, it's a very, very difficult situation to, to, to uncover. Uh, wh when it comes to that, then that sort of makes <clears throat> me think about how we intervene earlier so that we don't even get to that stage. And that's that's work that that you and I worked, ran the full gamut uh, in our time together of the set of situations that might come forward in the school in terms of safeguarding suicide was one of them. There was another incident where we had disclosures where we were able to intervene on abuse. Uh, somebody uh, taking advantage of a student uh, from the outside of school who wasn't part of our community, but who had groomed a family who had been uh, part of, uh, of, of, of their lives in a way that had made them trust them. In dealing with all of these things and knowing that they're out there in every school, regardless of the socioeconomic uh, nature of the school, regardless of uh, whether they're a private school, whether they're a, a public school. What do you think are the main priorities for a head of school uh, and the safeguarding lead who are changing the culture to enable those things to come to light, to enable the right interventions to happen before we get to a crisis situation? I mean, I think if we're looking at changing culture, I would say, you know, really be mindful of our, our, our change management approach with safeguarding. This is something that I think we're, you know, safeguarding can very easily become a tick box approach no compliance idea that we've got to do this because of CAS. We've got to do this because of, um, you know, the, the the accreditation we're in or, or whatever. But the reality is we're doing this because we know that it, it leads the students re reaching their potential if they feel safe and they can learn. And, that, and that's why we do this. It's got to be the fundamental bedrock of any school, right? Because if we're not feeling safe, then we can't learn. And I think that has to be the driving moment of that. So if we're thinking of change management, then we've got to be thinking of, right, how do we how do we create that guiding coalition? Right. How do we how do we get folks together around us and with us on this journey? And how do we how do we help them see? And I think a large part of that starts with that training, right? And getting folks trained at a level that opens up that door and helps them see the other side of the curtain, as we we often call it. And it's not a nice thing to see because once you see it, you can't unsee it, right? Um, but I think getting folks on board with that to then help drive that change. So it's not just your, your head or your DSL that are trying to move something forward. It's a community of folks saying, yeah, we want to get better at this. Because if we do that, then everyone in your community can be on board with, with being aware that this needs to change and also being aware that they have a huge role in it. That a whole school approach is vital to changing and to, and to becoming a safe school because everyone in your school will be part of it from, you know, the TAs, the cleaners, the, the classroom teachers, your senior leadership team, your governors, you know, your, your safeguarding governors, that, that everyone has a part to play. And of course, included in that are your students and, the, and their parents as well. And we've all got to work together on this. I think that's really important. I mean, it's really interesting going back to sexual harm, for example, between between children. You know, one of the things we know is that if you speak to them, they'll tell you that it's happening very frequently, right? And it is all it is it is very common uh, sexual harm between children. And we did it. There was a study done with with um, with CIS around around this. And one of the things that, that the children in that study told us was that. On the on the you know on a scale of doesn't happen very much to happens all the time, sexual harm was was towards the the, the all the time level. And then when we interviewed those parents, or we we got research from those parents, a hundred percent of the parents said they would know if this was happening. And of course, it wasn't happening. So the gap between the students and their parents is huge, especially when we talk about things like online harm and sexual harm. As a school who see these kids as much as the parents and in boarding schools more than the parents. We have to be 
know, we have to be part of that journey and we have to have a partnership with them. And so student voice is becoming more and more important with really understanding the, the, the levels of harm that are happening in that community and, and how we can help them with it. Shift from compliance to a whole school approach is, is vital if we're talking about managing change in this area. The emphasis on a whole school approach to safeguarding is not just a priority, but a cornerstone of our mission at BFIS. It's not just about training staff and students. It's about actively involving our entire school community in safeguarding efforts. We organize engaging parent workshops and provide platforms like the See Something, Say Something form for both parents and students to ensure that everyone plays a role in keeping our community safe. Moreover, every spring we conduct a student survey where we ask students to express their experiences, provide questions and concerns anonymously. Through this format, we're able to gather data on what we need to do to improve our school community. And by nurturing a culture of vigilance and accountability, we're not just ensuring safety, we're creating an environment where everyone feels supported and empowered. Together, we're building a community where every member knows that they have a voice and a role in making our school a safe and welcoming place. With each initiative we, we take on, we're taking proactive steps and measures towards a brighter, safer future for all at BFIS. So if we're putting together a comprehensive well-being curriculum that spirals up uh, developmentally for young people, yeah. How can we engage parents in that? How can they close that gap and, and, and be partners in ensuring that their child is, is safe? So, tr you know, training is, su is super important for, for parents, I think, and involving them in the, the work that we do in schools in, in, in voice as well and have them part of that. I think, you know, understanding, you know, one of the shifts that, that helps with this is around behaviour. And we talked earlier about a trauma-informed approach to behaviour and the importance of seeing behaviour as communication and then adapting our approach to that and moving away from retributive concepts of behaviour management towards restorative ones where we're building that community. Um, and that's an area that often can, can really push parents away and create this distance between the school and the parent because they're defending their child's behaviour and we're punishing that behaviour. And so if we can change that dynamic, I think that's a really great way of us reaching to them and, and, and working with them on these cases of where well, really we're talking about kind of moving forward that that picture. Prevention is, is absolutely key. And, and that's where that education of parents and students is important. And one of the benefits of the pandemic is we've realised the tools we have to reach parents in a more effective way. People who are very busy and have busy lives and and jobs that they can't always give up to come to a school session in school, but they can hop on a call in the office. Adapting that online learning model and, and reaching out to parents in, in ways that can that can help them access that information is is really important. Um, but then as an international school, of course, we then we've got to then look at that other lens of culture and, and how we access that information because not everyone accesses it in the same way, in the same language. But also we've got to understand when we talk to folks from from other communities, you know, what this information will mean to them and, and whether it presents a threat and how do we how do we mitigate that with them, right? And get them on board as partners. And so I think adopting a you know a learning approach to that is really key and joining with members of that community to learn from them about okay, how do we work in this? And how, how, how do we understand safeguarding in your context? What's, what matters for you? How do you understand this? Especially when we're an international school in a culture that's very different to the one that we come from. You know, that, that's super important. Um, I think if I think back to my time in South Korea, God, my learning curve was just so steep because it was a culture that was in every way completely different to the one I'd grown up in. And I've grown up in Germany and, and the UK, but still a very Western approach. And so I think that adopting that not knowing approach is, is key. I think another area that, that can be a source of risk is also transitions. And the work that Doug Ota and Span have done around understanding the nature of a transition for a young folk is, is really important. And us understanding that when international school parents come to us with their families, they're in a transition. And actually through being with us, even if it's for a year or two years, that transition is so important, isn't it? And how can we help them 
go through that? And how do we make sure that we don't add to harm as well? You know, it's, there's a really interesting piece of research Doug Oat has just done into this that, that, that looks at the relationship between children and schools as attachment. And, and his, he hasn't, his hypothesis is that as much as students attach to their caregivers, later on in their in their life, they also attach to their schools and, and, their, and their peers and their teachers. And if they're an international school and they're transient through that, what does that mean for their attachment? And that's, I think that's a really interesting question and one that is a thread that certainly needs to be pulled because if, that's, if that is a case, then wow, that's a, a real area to be aware of, right? That's something that we've got to be super mindful of in terms of the impact we have on young folks. So all of this is, as you can see, it's, a, it's complex, right? But uh, it's good work, I think. It's certainly very complex, the sort of multi-layers to that. And that's part of the journey, isn't it? You can put some of the straightforward layers in about policy and practice, but looking at relationships more deeply and really trying to figure out where where am I in my safeguarding leading journey in the context I'm in, in the country I'm in, working with the demographic that I have in school. So um, I might be in Germany working with you know, a population which is 10% Saudi Arabian families. Each one of those families is different, but have a share, some shared values about how they meet us as a school that are thinking about safeguarding. So um, the, the legal constraints then come up there as well. Uh, if I'm in a particular country as an international school, I might grapple with being compliant and cognizant of best practices in a particular country um, and, of course, following their laws. What's the international school gold standard as far as safeguarding is concerned first? And then how do you adapt that in different in, in different scenarios in different countries yeah so i mean the gold standard comes from those expectations in the task force that were released in 2021 and and they are you know that's the 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 umbrella for how we do safeguarding right and it will be it will be it will adapt right it's not a set in stone concept but i think that's that's the thing we should be looking at to say right these are the standards for 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 everything that we do from accreditation agencies to boards of schools, to the schools themselves and then the communities around them. That really needs to be our starting point. And so folks, if, you, if you're listening to this and you haven't heard of those, look them up. They're really key into understanding why we do what we do. And then from that, I've just mentioned earlier, you know, we've, we've, meant, we've developed this toolkit as a response to that really, right? So that's been our, our seed, if you will. And the, the toolkit is kind of the tree that's coming from that because it's about how we give a tool to a school that uses those expectations and standards to then develop your practice in a school and is something that you can adapt to any school in the world. And that's really key about that approach is it's an international toolkit. It's not just a safeguarding toolkit, it's an international one because you need to have that basis and that understanding of what you need in your school for safeguarding, but there also needs to be room within that to understand the culture you're in right and i think a big part of that is being cognizant and checking your legal advice your local legal advice right um that's really key if you haven't mapped that out as a school do it it has to underline your safeguarding policies and i think the the other aspect of that is convention of rights for a child right and then that's something that almost every country in the world has signed up to and so that also underpins what you do and so if you're ever having that and that this can be difficult because we you can have strong guidance in a country around data protection and GDPR. But then you can also have a child first approach where you need to share some information because otherwise that child's going to be at risk. And that's a really tricky place to be in. So get your legal advice on that as well. But then understand as well that the generally the UN Convention of Rights of a Child will, will trump most things. And so what I've also, I mean, we've experienced that, haven't we, Rach, where you speak to a, a data protection lawyer, they'll tell you one thing and you speak to a child protection lawyer and they'll tell you another in the same country. So that's always something to be aware of. But, you know, throughout our toolkit, we highlight where you need to check your, like, your legal advice on this one because it can change drastically, right? And then I think, you know, what should always run through, no matter what culture you're in, a student first approach needs to apply. You know, student safety first, right? That we have to start with that and we build everything else around it. And as I said earlier, you know, that the, the, that's why we do this work is to keep students safe so they can learn to their potential. 
we don't do it to check boxes. We don't do it because of compliance. You know, and, and I think that has to underpin what we're doing in any culture we're doing. Dan's insight on the importance of the student-first approach deeply resonate with our ethos at BFIS. To ensure student safety remains our top priority, we've implemented a comprehensive child protection policy that involves regular training sessions for staff, clear reporting procedures, and thorough background checks for all employees and volunteers. We understand that safeguarding goes beyond just policies and protocols. It's about empowering our students with the knowledge and tools that they need to keep themselves and others safe. For instance, we've initiated a program where we annually engage all of our students in identifying five trusted adults. This ensures that regardless of transitions, our children know who to turn to for support and guidance. Furthermore, in response to the evolving challenges posed by technology, we've introduced digital citizenship lessons across the school. These lessons empower our students by teaching them responsible online behavior, enabling them to navigate the internet safely while respecting each other's rights. Moreover, we've recognized the importance of listening to our families and students and staff and responding to their needs. This year, we're currently revising our sexuality, health, and well-being curriculum, engaging both students, staff, and parents in focus groups to ensure that it meets our students' needs and aligns with our BFIS values. Ultimately, we believe that through education, policy development, and open communication, we can bridge gaps and create a safer, more inclusive community. It's like Rachel states, we need to communicate it seven times, seven different ways, so that we all begin to speak a common language around this work. Access to resources like the International Safeguarding Toolkit allows us to continuously grow and improve, ensuring that our school continues to provide a safe haven for all of our children. So as we review and revise, as we always do, at the end of each year, we're reflecting on our well-being curriculum and we have a well-being curriculum. It's taught by our counsellors, which I know is, is always a dream uh, of yours and mine as we as we move some puzzle pieces around in our in our prior lives. What should well-being encompass in yeah. a modern international school? I think we talked earlier a bit about a trauma-informed approach, and I think that's a really key area to to having that lens of how we view behavior, but also how we teach in a, in a classroom, like how we manage behavior in the classroom. If teachers can, can understand things like polyvagal theory when they're managing behavior in a classroom, understand that students go from safe and social to fight, then flight, and then all the way to shutdown. If we understand behavior in that way, we're gonna to respond to it differently. And I think that's that's key in terms of any classroom. But in terms of the, the curriculum itself, you know, prevention has to be a theme of education. We, we're doing this to prevent. So what I often see is schools having a problem in school and then going, right, we need to do some sex education now. Or right, we need to do some online learning. And that's not prevention, right? That's reaction. So what we need to be doing is looking at that well-being curriculum. Um, I really like a spiral approach in a school. And so starting and having the whole school spiraling up from primary to your to your IB and, and looking at where on that journey that classroom is and, and then mapping out where they're going to be next year and where they're going to be the year after that. So that there's a there's a pathway for them in their education, and it's not something that's done in grade nine and then forgotten about for the rest of the, the time at school. Um, I think one area that's really interesting way of approaching this is themes and adopting a theme as a, as a whole school, um, so that your curriculum works around that theme and it becomes something that you do in every part of your school. Wellbeing curriculum shouldn't be just one classroom; it should be across your entire curriculum. And, and reaching out into various areas. And it, look, it looks in the literacy that you're, that you're looking at in your English lesson, but it also reaches into the stuff we're learning in biology as well, right? So if we have that embedded into our whole curriculum, when we then touch on it in those tutor sessions or those pastoral lessons, it's part of that wider picture. It's part of the assemblies we're doing that week as well. Um, and then there's a relevancy to it. It's not this thing that's just once done. If you speak to students about what they want, they're really clear with us that they want this. They really want to learn about this stuff. In fact, sometimes more than anything else. And so we've got to meet that need, right? Because they'll find out about it other ways. 
that aren't necessarily where we want them to go. So I think that's that's key, a whole school approach and getting everyone on board with that. Yes, have your experts teach it, but let's all be involved in that journey too, I think. There's a really interesting piece of uh, collaboration right now between the task force and CASEL, and they're developing a social and emotional skills framework. So watch out for that. That's going to be really key in giving us the touch point about what we need to be covering in a, in a school in this area. And then I think, as I said before, you know, running through all of this is, is transitions. And we need to do more about helping young folk in international schools know their place in transitions and, and what the, what transitions means to them and how we prepare them really crucially for leaving us and how we prepare them for the next stage. Because we can do all the wonderful work we do in a school, but if they when they go to university, they're not prepared for that transition. And for an, for an international student, I'd suggest they're most at risk of that because it is often they're moving country when that happens. It's a huge transition. So how do we prepare them for that? Really interestingly, one of in Doug Ota's recent research, in opposition to what he thought would happen, what we're actually seeing is that students in international schools have more resiliency to transitions. So instead of seeing more risk because more transitions are happening, what we're actually seeing is that students are developing more resiliency to this and they're developing more coping mechanisms due to the, the more transitions they go through. So to that student that has gone from school to school to school multiple times within their high school education that we've all been highlighting thinking they're going to be really struggling here. And, and, and in some ways they will be, but in other ways, actually they're learning some really crucial skills and they're able to adapt easily or more easier, I think. And so that's a really interesting piece of research that's come out around that, that I think is really worth looking at to see, okay, how does that interact with our well-being curriculum? You know, how do we understand that? And how do we learn from that too? And how do we help folks transition in ways that are supportive to them? All of that is, is part of that well-being curriculum. And I think, you know, probably goes without saying, but well-being curriculum is not just about sex education anymore. You know, we've got to look broader than that. That's hugely important. A comprehensive sexual education, absolutely. But we've also got to be looking at, you know, online spaces. We've got to be looking at peer-on-peer -peer harm and safeguarding. We've got to be looking at drugs, alcohol, um, awareness, things like that. How we use technology more and more. AI is going to be a big part of this, how we can use that in our lives. So all of this is, you know, it's a huge area. And if you think about that as a curriculum, that is broad. <laughs> And it's about as broad as it gets. And that's why it can't just be down to one counsellor to do as a curriculum. It's got to be something that as the whole school takes on board as a, as a cornerstone of what we do in education. Dan's insights on child protection and student well-being deeply connect with our school community. As he emphasized, ensuring students feel safe and supported is crucial, especially considering the significant amount of time they spend in school. This sentiment directly ties into our ongoing reflections about our comprehensive sexuality, health, and well-being curriculum, which is currently under review. Recently, during one of our reflections, our counselor shared a student's quote. The student stated, quote, the well-being topic of child protection really resonated with me. It is of high importance to me and in general for children to have resources to contact when something isn't right especially in a place like school. Most children are afraid to tell adults what is going on in their lives and if something is wrong. So I think it is just amazing how many people are on the child protection team at BFIS and that we know every one of those people is trustworthy. It really puts me at ease that if something happens to me, I have a team of people there to help me get through. End of quote. Our student highlighted the importance of having resources and support readily available, just as Dan suggested. This underscores the significance of embedding these principles into our well-being curriculum. By integrating themes of child protection, trauma-informed approaches, and support mechanisms throughout our curriculum, we're not only addressing immediate needs, but also proactively equipping our students with the skills and knowledge to navigate challenging situations. This feedback from our students reinforces the importance of our efforts and serves as a reminder of the impact our well-being curriculum has on their daily lives. On a separate note, the students' feedback also 
underscores the significance of our dedicated child protection team and teachers, and that most of all, that what we're doing makes sense and matters, and that it provides peace of mind for our students. Knowing that they have a trustworthy support system readily available if they ever counter difficulties is invaluable. This feedback serves as a critical reminder for us to continue communicating this information, but more importantly, this is exactly why we wake up every morning to do this work. Dan, in answer to the last question, you mentioned a couple of times in their student voice. That's yeah. what I heard. Um, I know that CIS has been doing some work on student voice. We at BFAS have been doing some work on student voice. What does capturing quality student voice look like? And what does it do for us? If I start moving backwards on that, you know, what it, what it does for us is it, is it really helps us understand what's going on in our schools. You know, it really gives us a touchstone into the kinds of harm they're experiencing, uh, the kinds of harm they're worried about, but also the solutions to those things too. And I think that's a really key aspect we sometimes forget about self-student um, voice is that not only do they know what's going on in their communities and the harm they're experiencing, but also in some areas, they, they also know some of the solutions to these and, and then can think about them in a way that we can't, especially when we're talking about the use of online harm and, and, and technology. I think that they have a, a an expertise in that, that that just develops by the day. You know, what does it look like? I think it can look like many things. And I think that's the the takeaway I'd say for folks to, to think about with student voice. There isn't just one way of doing it. Um, yes, you can do surveys and they're really helpful about giving us some data and some really rich data, but there are many ways to do it. And I think involving students in how you do it is also really key. So you know, if we're looking at surveys, get a student community together to help develop that survey and language that the students will understand. That's a key area to look at. But research is a great way to involve students in student voice. So I've just finished a master's in art. My dissertation was based on a piece of participatory action research we did with students and staff on developing behavior policy. We took a behavior policy we had, got the students involved and said, right, what, what do we think? Right. And, and, and let's do some research about what behavior policies there are out there and what the research says about effective behavior management. And then let's get back around the table and compare notes and and build a, a new approach. And, you know, what they came back with we just and the way they thought about it what was insight that we just never would have come up with as a star. You know, and, and the, the learning I got from that was really key. What also can then happen is, you know, there's your safeguarding, there's your guiding coalition right there. But not only does that involve staff, that now involves students. And what a difference that can make in your community if the students are part of that safeguarding journey from the start in developing and looking at where your focus needs to be. How do they get involved in that and how do they then drive that through the rest of the community? So there are two ways. I think other ways that we can get students involved in student voice in particular with safeguarding is anonymous reporting. And I think that's a, a very difficult area for a lot of schools to get their heads around. But we know that if it's anonymous, if they have a way to give us an anonymous voice, we can get even more rich information about that, um, especially when part of the concerns are maybe around staff or all around the way we're doing things as a school, using an anonymous reporting methods. Um, and there's lots out there that are, that are developing. I know that CPOMs and my concern are two leading uh, online reporting mechanisms out there are developing tools in this area too. I know that um, there's also a, a, a separate organization called Student Voice that are doing something similar. So I think there's lots of tools out there to use, but I think the key is about making sure that it's as accessible as possible and then not and and you know part of student voice is also about students voice in their community you know leadership wise so so how are they having that we talk about school council a lot and a lot of schools have school councils are they tokenistic you know are they students that meet once a month have a nice cup of tea with someone moan about the things they don't like and then you know repeat that for about 12 times a year or are they given real voice and choice in what we do as a school? And do we listen to them and then change what we do because of it? And I think I, I'd like the latter to be happening, right? So, 
you know, let's make sure that we're, we're using those student leadership organizations and diversifying that, giving them different areas to lead as well. It doesn't have to just be one student council. You can have a student committee on safeguarding and you can have a student committee on behavior and then you can have student you know, committee about boarding if you're a boarding school or about your curriculum. I mean, that's another area, right? Let's have a student committee around how we're designing our curriculum and get feedback from them into that. It's a really great way to hear from them and to hear their voice and also then to design what they need around that. Yeah, and not just, that's not the only aspect. There's many other pieces of that puzzle, but I think, you know, using diversity in that way is really important. And I think when we're talking about diversity, it's also really important to make sure that we're getting a diverse range of student voice as well. We're not just getting the extrovert, popular voice, the student that's involved in everything anyway. We need to be reaching those that don't speak to us. And that's where that anonymous reporting comes into. But I think also looking at your, you know, actively seeking out the minorities in your school and providing them with voice. The work that we that you did in, in Hanover, Rachel, around, uh, you know, we called it Jedi at the time, right? And, and about raising awareness of the harm folks had experienced from from minority perspective in terms of racism, but in terms of homophobia and everything like that, and giving folks anonymous voice to raise that concern. And then sharing that with a community um, was so powerful. And the way that changed that community's focus on that issue was just so key. And I think that examples like that are crucial if we're going to change our mindset and be really aware of how we change the current community discourse and momentum in that area. Because so often we're, 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 we're trying to change a situation that's already broke. With, with young folk and the minority to look at, you know, they look at the world and they don't see people who look like themselves being represented in what they want to do. And we've got to find a way to change that. And it's got to start with schools. So I think giving them real voice in that area and helping them help us shape what we do is, is vital. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. It does. And I'm going to ask you one more question. And I promise this is the last one because your time is super precious. And because every minute of it is an impactful, I know your work is, is, is really valued. What would my elevator speech be when a parent says to me, we've gone too far in safeguarding. My child's fine. You don't need to worry about them. I really just want to worry about the curriculum. I want to worry about the, the three R's, the rigor. We're worrying too much about mm well-being we're worrying too much about safeguarding child protection what's that like let's move on i i might i might say to that parent one of the reasons your child is feeling so safe and they're able to do what you think they can do right now is because of the work we're doing here so we've got to keep that going right because if we stop this stuff then we're not going to get to what you want remember this is not an and or thing it's a this and then that so yeah, we're going to be looking at your curriculum and yeah, we're going to be pushing that forward. And so much of that is, is all this work. I mean, talk about student voice, for example. Students having a voice are going to feel more empowered. They're going to be able to take risks. They're going to be able to think of different ways that they can learn and they're going to be able to push forward their education. Safeguarding is such a fundamental aspect. It's not just the Maslow hierarchy of what we need. It's also about self-actualization, right? It's about how we, as an adult and how we, as a child, learn. You know, if we can, if we can learn to our fullest potential, then we'll achieve really great things. But we can only learn to our fullest potential if we can take risks, and we can only take risks if we feel safe to do so, and we've been able to take risks in a safe environment. If we stop the work we're doing on safeguarding, we're going to go backwards. That's the way it works. We can never do enough in this area yeah we've always got to keep going because the risks always develop and they always change and I think if a, if a school feels that um we're going too far in this then come come with us on this then come and come with me to this training with CIS come with me and look at the toolkit you know let's let's work together and let me help you understand the why of this because the why is often the thing that's missing there i think look behind that curtain and see what's really happening 100% of those parents said they would know if sexual harm was going on with their kids and yet their kids said it was happening on a daily basis there's a gap there 
right? So looking at it from a motivational interviewing perspective, we need to make you aware of that gap. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe that's where the presentations around anonymous student voice are key, right? This is what the students are telling us. And then that's their drive. I've always felt that, you know, change management in particular with safeguarding can hit many roadblocks. But when it comes to student voice and what the students are telling us, that's a powerful motivator for any educator and, of course, any parent. And it can be a scary thing, too. And it can be super uncomfortable. Yeah, because no one likes reading, you know, feedback that says we're not doing the best job we think we're doing. But if we're safe as an organization, we can say we know the only way to get better is to is to always want to improve. That's good. You know, I always like to go back to, um, I can't remember his name, it was an AFL, Aussie, Aussie football, Aussie rules coach who would say to his players, you know, I want you to be comfortable out of your comfort zone. I want you to spend your time out of your comfort zone because that's where you're going to learn. And that doesn't mean that you're always safe because there's an element of risk there. But we're going to spend some time there and get to know that area because if we just spend our life in our comfort zone, we're not going to get anywhere. So as a parent, yeah, this feels uncomfortable right now. Yeah, this feels scary. And you think we're not doing the right, you're not, we're not looking at the right thing, but let's spend some time here together and let's engage with you on that. And let's walk it together. I think that's the the way I'd approach that parent. Ben, thank you so much. I am excited for the the kids, for the international school community, for the wider uh, schools that you impact, uh, and in your new role, the, the sort of impact that you will have through your work with educators, through your work with young people, through your work with parents, um, uh, will will mean that this work uh, goes from strength to strength and more kids feel like they have that efficacy in their own lives, that they are safe, that trauma might not happen to them because of the preventative work that happens before. I'm really proud to call you a thought partner. I look forward to to seeing you again, uh, hopefully chatting to you again soon. For sure, anytime, Rich. There's a lot that young people normalize about how the world works and wiring young people at school and home to expect better to share their feelings and protect themselves and their peers is a key tenet of a high quality school. Statistically, at some point, your child is going to need to protect themselves against a peer, an older student, an adult who would take advantage of them or their own urge to to, to self-harm. Equipping them with the self-esteem, the language, the support networks, the knowledge that we have their back at home and in school is crucial. Belonging is a powerful tool so that students are able to stand alone around the pressure of others. Genuine love and care. Someone to listen to them at home supersedes peers, even when we think we've lost them. Even when we think they're not listening to us. Taking care of self is a foundation of Maslow's hierarchy and no learning can occur until a student feels safe and cared for. Dan and I have seen what happens when schools or parents assume children have this. So awareness, a balance of letting out the rope of parenting while ensuring children have explicitly learned the tools to first hold on with one hand and let go completely and is paramount to healthy, safe childhood into adult learning. We've also seen what happens when schools don't professionalise their safeguarding practice and put in place the policies and procedures to keep kids safe, to lift learning, to triangulate arising issues out of school and at school and professionally respond to them. At BFAS, we have a board, full staff and affiliated staff who are trained and dedicated to child safeguarding with some parents engaging in the training we offer. Every day is a journey to bring ourselves to the highest standards outlined by the International Task Force for Child Protection. Belonging and relationships will be a recurrent theme throughout our show as we constantly keep coming back to what will not change about the education of young people and what we think sets BFAS apart. <laughs>